This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alan Davis Drake at PaintedRiceCakes.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 17, Section A. What parallel courses did Bloom and Stephen follow, returning? Starting united both at normal walking pace from Beresford Place, they followed in the order named Lower and Middle Gardner Streets and Mountjoy Square West, then at reduced pace, each bearing left Gardner's Place by an inadvertence as far as the farther corner of Temple Street, then at reduced pace with interruptions of halt, bearing right, Temple Street North as far as Hardwick Place. Approaching disparate at relaxed walking pace, they crossed both the circus before George's church diametrically, the cord in any circle being less than the arc which it subtends. Of what did the duumvirate deliberate during their itinerary? Music, literature, Ireland, Dublin, Paris, friendship, women, prostitution, diet, the influence of gaslight or the light of arc and glow lamps on the growth of adjoining paraheliotropic trees, exposed corporation emergency dust buckets, the Roman Catholic Church, ecclesiastical celibacy, the Irish nation, Jesuit education, careers, the study of medicine, the past day, the maleficent influence of the pre-Sabbath, Stephen's collapse. Did Bloom discover common factors of similarity between their respective like and unlike reactions to experience? Both were sensitive to artistic impressions, musical in preference to plastic or pictorial. Both preferred a continental to an insular manner of life, a cisatlantic to a transatlantic place of residence, both indurated by early domestic training and an inherited tendency of heterodox resistance profess their disbelief in many orthodox religious national social and ethical doctrines both admitted the alternately stimulating and obtunding influence of heterosexual magnetism were their views on some points divergent Stephen dissented openly from Bloom's views on the importance of dietary and civic self-help, while Bloom dissented tacitly from Stephen's views on the eternal affirmation of the spirit of man in literature. Bloom assented covertly to Stephen's rectification of the anachronism involved in assigning the date of the conversion of the Irish nation to Christianity from Druidism by Patrick, son of Calpornus, son of Potitus, son of Odysseus, sent by Pope Celestine I in the year 432, in the reign of Leary, to the year 260 or thereabouts, in the reign of Cormac MacArt, died 266 A.D., suffocated by imperfect deglutition of ailment at Sleddy, and interred at Rosnery. The collapse which Bloom ascribed to gastric inanition, and certain chemical compounds of varying degrees of adulteration and alcoholic strength, accelerated by mental exertion and the velocity of rapid circular motion in a relaxing atmosphere. Stephen attributed to the reapparition of a matutinal cloud, perceived by both from two different points of observation, Sandy Cove and Dublin, at first no bigger than a woman's hand. Was there one point on which their views were equal and negative? The influence of gaslight or electric light on the growth of adjoining paraheliotropic trees. Had Bloom discussed similar subjects during nocturnal perambulations in the past? In 1884, with Owen Goldberg and Cecil Turnbull at night on public thoroughfares between Longwood Avenue and Leonard's Corner, and Leonard's Corner and Sing Street, and Sing Street and Bloomfield Avenue. 
in eighteen eighty five with percy apjohn in the evenings reclining against the wall between gibraltar villa and bloomfield house in crumlin barony of uppercross in eighteen eighty six occasionally with casual acquaintances and prospective purchasers on doorsteps in front parlors in third-class railway cars of suburban lines in eighteen eighty eight frequently with major brian tweedy and his daughter miss marion tweedy together and separately on the lounge in matthew dillon's house in round town once in eighteen ninety two and once in eighteen ninety three with julius judah mastiansky on both occasions in the parlor of his bloom's house in lombard street west what reflection concerning the irregular sequence of dates eighteen eighty four eighteen eighty five eighteen eighty six eighteen eighty eight eighteen ninety two eighteen ninety three nineteen o four did bloom make before their arrival at their destination he reflected that the progressive extension of the field of individual development and experience was regressively accompanied by a restriction of the converse domain of inter-individual relations as in what ways from inexistence to existence he came to many and was as one received existence with existence he was with any as any with any from existence to non-existence gone he would be by all as non-perceived what act did bloom make on their arrival at their destination at the house steps of the fourth of the equidifferent uneven numbers number seven eccle street he inserted his hand mechanically into the back pocket of his trousers to obtain his latch-key. Was it there? It was in the corresponding pocket of the trousers which he had worn on the day but one preceding. Why was he doubly irritated? Because he had forgotten, and because he remembered that he had reminded himself twice not to forget what were then the alternatives before the premeditatedly respectively and inadvertently keyless couple to enter or not to enter to knock or not to knock bloom's decision a stratagem resting his feet on the dwarf wall he climbed over the area railings compressed his hat on his head grasped two points at the lower union of rails and stiles lowered his body gradually by its length of five feet nine inches and a half to within two feet ten inches of the area pavement and allowed his body to move freely in space by separating himself from the railings and crouching in preparation for the impact of the fall did he fall by his body's known weight of eleven stone and four pounds in avra de poise measure as certified by the graduated machine for periodical self-weighing at the premises of francis frodman pharmaceutical chemist of nineteen frederick street north on the last feast of the ascension to wit the twelfth day of may of the besectile year one thousand nine hundred and four of the christian era jewish era five thousand six hundred and sixty four mohammedan era one thousand three hundred and twenty two golden number five epact thirteen solar cycle nine Dominical letters C B, Roman indication two, Julian period six six one seven, M C, M I V. Did he rise uninjured by concussion? Regaining new stable equilibrium, he rose uninjured though concussed by the impact, raised the latch of the area door by the exertion of force at its freely moving flange and by leverage of the first kind applied at its fulcrum 
gained retarded access to the kitchen through the subadjacent scullery, ignited a lucifer match by friction, set free inflammable coal gas by turning on the ventcock, lit a high flame which, by regulating, he reduced the quiescent candescence, and lit finally a portable candle. What discreet succession of images did Stephen meanwhile perceive? Reclined against the area railings, he perceived through the transparent kitchen panes a man regulating a gas flame of 14 cp, a man lighting a candle of 1 cp, a man removing in turn each of his two boots, a man leaving the kitchen holding a candle. Did the man reappear elsewhere? After a lapse of four minutes, the glimmer of his candle was discernible through the semi-transparent, semi-circular glass fanlight over the hall door. The hall door turned gradually on its hinges. In the open space of the doorway, the man reappeared without his hat, with his candle. Did Stephen obey his sign? Yes. Entering softly, he helped to close and chain the door, and followed softly along the hallway the man's back, and listed feet and lighted candle past a lighted crevice of doorway on the left, and carefully down a turning staircase of more than five steps into the kitchen of Bloom's house. What did Bloom do? He extinguished the candle by a sharp expiration of breath upon its flame drew two spoon-seat deal chairs to the hearthstone, one for Stephen with its back at the area window, the other for himself when necessary, knelt on one knee, composed in the grate a pyre of cross-laid resin-tipped sticks and various colored papers and irregular polygons of best Abram coal at twenty-one shillings a ton from the yard of Messrs. Flower and MacDonald of 14 Dolliver Street, kindled it at three projected points of paper with one ignited lucifer match, thereby releasing the potential energy contained in the fuel, by allowing its carbon and hydrogen elements to enter into free union with the oxygen of the air. Of what similar apparitions did Stephen think? Of others elsewhere in other times who, kneeling on one knee or on two, had kindled fires for him. Of Brother Michael in the infirmary of the College of the Society of Jesus at Clongeswood Salins, in the county of Kildare. Of his father, Simon Dedalus, in an unfurnished room of his first residence in Dublin, number 13 Fitzgibbon Street, of his godmother, Miss Kate Morkin, in the house of her dying sister, Miss Julia Morkin, at 15 Usher's Island, of his aunt Sarah, wife of Richie, Richard Goulding, in the kitchen of their lodgings at 62 Clanbrassel Street, of his mother Mary, wife of Simon Dedalus, in the kitchen of number 12 North Richmond Street, in the morning of the feast of St. Francis Xavier, 1898, of the Dean of Studies, Father Butt, in the Physics Theatre of University College, 16 Stevens Green North, of his sister Dilly, Dahlia, in his father's house in Cabra. What did Stephen see on raising his gaze to the height of a yard from the fire towards the opposite wall? Under a row of five coiled spring house bells, a curvy lineal rope stretched between two holdfasts athwart across the recess beside the chimney pier, from which hung four small sized square handkerchiefs folded unattached consecutively in adjacent rectangles, and one pair of ladies' grey hose with lisle suspender tops and feet in their habitual position clamped by three erect wooden pegs, two at their outer extremities, and a third at their point of junction. What did Bloom see on the range? On the right smaller hob, a blue enameled saucepan. On the left larger hob, a black iron kettle. What did Bloom do at the range? He removed the saucepan to the left hob, 
rose and carried the iron kettle to the sink in order to tap the current by turning the faucet to let it flow did it flow yes from roundwood reservoir in county wicklow of a cubic capacity of twenty four hundred million gallons percolating through a subterranean aqueduct of filter mains of single and double pipage constructed at an initial plant cost of five pounds per linear yard by way of the dargle rathdown glen of the downs and callow hill to the twenty-six acre reservoir at still organ a distance of twenty-two statute miles and thence through a system of relieving tanks by a gradient of two hundred and fifty feet to the city boundary of eustace bridge upper leeson street though from prolonged summer drought and daily supply of twelve and a half million gallons the water had fallen below the sill of the overflow where for which reason the borough surveyor and the waterworks engineer mr spencer hearty c e on the instructions of the waterworks committee had prohibited the use of municipal water for purposes other than those of consumption envisaging the possibility of recourse being had to the impotable water of the grand and royal canals as in eighteen ninety three particularly as the south dublin guardians notwithstanding their ration of fifteen gallons per day per pauper supplied through a six-inch meter had been convicted of a wastage of twenty thousand gallons per night by a reading of their meter on the affirmation of the law agent of the corporation mr ignatius rice solicitor thereby acting to the detriment of another section of the public self-supporting taxpayers solvent sound what in water did bloom water lover drawer of water water carrier returning to the range admire its universality its democratic equality and consistency to its nature in seeking its own level its vastness in the ocean of mercator's projection its unplumbed profundity in the sundam trench of the pacific exceeding eight thousand fathoms the restlessness of its waves and surface particles visiting in turn all points of its seaboard the independence of its units the variability of states of sea, its hydrostatic quiescence in calm, its hydrokinetic turgidity in neap and spring tides, its subsidence after devastation, its sterility in the circumpolar ice caps, Arctic and Antarctic, its climactic and commercial significance, its preponderance of three to one over the dry land of the globe its indisputable hegemony extending in square leagues over all the region below the sub-equatorial tropic of capricorn the multi-secular stability of its primal basin its ludi ulfavus bed its capacity to dissolve and hold in solution all soluble substances including millions of tons of the most precious metals its slow erosions of peninsulas and islands its persistent formation of homeothetic islands peninsulas and downward tending promontories its alluvial deposits its weight and volume and density its imperturbability in lagoons and highland tarns its graduation of colors in the torrid and temperate and frigid zones its vehicular ramifications in continental lake-contained streams and confluent ocean-flowing rivers with their tributaries and transoceanic currents gulf streams north and south equatorial courses its violence in sea-quakes water-spouts artesian wells eruptions torrents eddies freshets spates ground swells watersheds water partings geysers cataracts whirlpools maelstroms inundations deluges cloudbursts its vast circumterrestrial a horizontal curve its secrecy in springs and latent humidity revealed by rhabdomantic or hygrometric instruments and exemplified by the well by the hole in the wall at ashtown gate 
saturation of air, distillation of dew, the simplicity of its composition, two constituent parts of hydrogen and one constituent part of oxygen, its healing virtues, its buoyancy in the waters of the Dead Sea, its persevering penetrativeness in runnels, gullies, inadequate dams, leaks on shipboard its properties for cleansing, quenching thirsts and fire, nourishing vegetation, its infallibility as paradigm and paragon, its metamorphosis as vapor, mist, cloud, rain, sleet, snow, hail, its strength in rigid hydrants, its variety of forms in loch and bays and gulfs and bights and guts and lagoons and atolls and archipelagos and sounds and fjords and minches and tidal estuaries and arms of sea its solidity in glaciers icebergs ice flows its docility in working hydraulic mill wheels turbines dynamos electric power stations bleach works tanneries scutch mills its utility in canals, rivers, if navigable, floating and graving docks, its potentiality derivable from harnessed tides of watercourses falling from level to level, its submarine fauna and flora, an acoustic photophobe, numerically, if not literally, the inhabitants of the globe, its ubiquity as constituting 90% of the human body, the noxiousness of its effluvia in lacustrine marshes, pestilential fens, faded flower water, stagnant pools in the waning moon. Having set the half-filled kettle on the now burning coals, why did he return to the still flowing tap? To wash his soiled hands with a partially consumed tablet of Barrington's lemon-flavored soap, to which paper still adhered bought thirteen hours previously for four pence and still unpaid for in fresh cold never changing ever changing water and dry them face and hands in a long red bordered holland cloth passed over a wooden revolving roller what reason did stephen give for declining bloom's offer that he was a hydrophobe hating partial contact by immersion or total by submersion in cold water his last bath having taken place in the month of October of the preceding year, disliking the aqueous substances of glass and crystal, distrusting aquicities of thought and language. What impeded Bloom from giving Stephen counsel of hygiene and prophylactic, to which should be added suggestions concerning a preliminary wetting of the head and contraction of the muscles with rapid splashing of the face and neck and thoracic and epigastric region in case of sea or river bathing and parts of the human anatomy most sensitive to cold being the nape stomach thener or sole of foot the incompatibility of aquacity with the erratic originality of genius what additional didactic counsels did he similarly repress? Dietary, concerning the respective percentage of protein and caloric energy in bacon, saltling, and butter, the absence of the former in the last named, and the abundance of the latter in the first named. Which seemed to the host to be the predominant qualities of his guest? Confidence in himself an equal and opposite power of abandonment and recuperation. What concomitant phenomena took place in the vessel of liquid by the agency of fire? The phenomenon was ebullition, fanned by a constant updraft of ventilation between the kitchen and the chimney flue. Ignition was communicated from the faggots of precombustible fuel to polyhedral masses of bituminous coal containing in compressed mineral form the foliated fossilized decidua of primal forests, which had in turn derived their vegetative existence from the sun, primal source of heat, radiant, transmitted through omnipresent luminiferous diatherminous ether, heat 
convected, a mode of motion developed by such combustion, was constantly and increasingly conveyed from the source of calorification to the liquid contained in the vessel, being radiated through the uneven, unpolished, dark surface of the metal iron, in part reflected, in part absorbed, in part transmitted, gradually raising the temperature of the water from normal to boiling point a rise in temperature expressible as the result of an expenditure of 72 thermal units needed to raise one pound of water from 50 degrees to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. What announced the accomplishment of this rise in temperature? A double falciform ejection of water vapor from under the kettle lid at both sides simultaneously. For what personal purpose could Bloom have applied the water so boiled? To shave himself. What advantages attended shaving by night? A softer beard, a softer brush if intentionally allowed to remain from shave to shave in its agglutinated lather, a softer skin if unexpectedly encountering female acquaintances in remote places in uncustomary hours quiet reflections upon the course of the day, a cleaner sensation when awakening after a fresher sleep, since matitudinal noises, premonitions and perturbations, a clattered milk can, a postman's double knock, a paper read, re-read while lathering, re-lathering the same spot, a shock, a shoot, with thought of aught he sought, though fraught with naught, might cause a faster rate of shaving, and a nick on which incision plaster with precision cut and humected and applied adhered, which was to be done. Why did absence of light disturb him less than presence of noise? Because of the surety of the sense of touch in his firm, full, masculine, feminine, passive, active hand. What did it, his hand, possess, but with what counteracting influence? The operative surgical quality, but that he was reluctant to shed human blood, even when the end justified the means, preferring in their natural order heliotherapy, psychophysicotherapeutics, osteopathic surgery. What lay under exposure on the lower, middle, and upper shelves of the kitchen dresser, opened by Bloom. On the lower shelf, five vertical breakfast plates, six horizontal breakfast saucers on which rested inverted breakfast cups, a mustache cup uninverted and saucer of crown derby, four white gold-rimmed egg cups, an open chamois purse displaying coins, mostly copper, and a vial of aromatic violet comfits. On the middle shelf, a chipped egg cup containing pepper, a drum of table salt, four conglomerated black olives in oleaginous paper, an empty pot of plum trees potted meat, an oval wicker basket bedded with fiber and containing one jersey pear, a half-empty bottle of William Gilby and Company's white invalid port, half disrobed of its swathe of coral pink tissue paper, a packet of Epps soluble cocoa, five ounces of Ann Lynch's choice tea at two shillings per pound in a crinkled lead paper bag, a cylindrical canister containing the best crystallized lump sugar, two onions, one the larger Spanish, entire, the other smaller Irish, bisected with augmented surface and more redolent, a jar of Irish model dairy's cream, a jug of brown crockery containing a nagan and a quarter of soured adulterated milk, converted by heat into water, a sigillous serum and semi-solidified curds, which added to the quantity subtracted for Mr. Bloom's and Mrs. Fleming's breakfasts, made one imperial pint, the total quantity originally delivered, two cloves, a halfpenny, and a small dish containing a slice of fresh rib steak. On the upper shelf, a battery of jam jars, empty, of various sizes and provenances. What attracted his attention lying on the apron of the dresser? 
four polygonal fragments of two lacerated scarlet bedding tickets, numbered 887, 886. What reminiscences temporarily corrugated his brow? Reminiscences of coincidences, truth stranger than fiction, pre-indicative of the result of the gold cup flat handicap, the official and definite results of which he had read in the evening telegram, late pink edition, in the cabman shelter at Butt Bridge. Where had previous intimations of the result, affected or projected, been received by him? In Bernard Kierman's licensed premise, 8, 9, and 10, Little Britain Street, in David Byrne's licensed premise, 14, Duke Street, in O'Connell Street Lower, outside Graham Lemons, when a dark man had placed in his hand a throwaway, subsequently thrown away, advertising Elijah, restorer of the Church of Zion, in Lincoln Place, outside the premises of F. W. Sweeney and Company Limited, dispensing chemists, when Frederick M. Bantam Lyons had rapidly and successively requested, perused, and reconstituted the copy of the current issue of the Freeman's Journal and National Press, which he had been about to throw away, subsequently thrown away, he had proceeded towards the oriental edifice of the Turkish and Warm Baths, 11 Leinster Street, with the light of inspiration shining in his countenance and bearing in his arms the secret of the race, graven in the language of prediction. What qualifying considerations allayed his perturbations? The difficulties of interpretation, since the significance of any event followed its occurrence as variably as the acoustic report followed the electrical discharge, and counterestimating against an actual loss by failure to interpret the total sum of possible losses preceding originally from a successful interpretation. His mood? He had not risked. He did not expect. He had not been disappointed. He was satisfied. What satisfied him? To have gained no positive loss, to have brought a positive gain to others, light to the Gentiles. How did Bloom prepare a collation for a Gentile? He poured into two teacups two level spoonfuls, four and all, of Epps soluble cocoa, and proceeded, according to the directions for use printed on the label, to each adding, after sufficient time for infusion, the prescribed ingredients for diffusion, in the manner and in the quantity prescribed. What supererogatory remarks of special hospitality did the host show his guest? Relinquishing his symposiarchal right to the mustache cup of imitation crown derby presented to him by his only daughter, Millicent Millie, he substituted a cup identical with that of his guest and served extraordinarily to his guest and, in reduced measure to himself, the viscous cream ordinarily reserved for the breakfast of his wife, Marion, Molly. Was the guest conscious of and did he acknowledge these marks of hospitality? His attention was directed to them by his host, Jocosely and he accepted them seriously as they drank in joco-serious silence Epps mass-produced the creature Coco. Were there marks of hospitality which he contemplated but suppressed, reserving them for another and for himself on future occasions to complete the act begun? The reparation of a fissure of the length of one and a half inches in the right side of his guest's pocket, a gift to his guest of one of the four ladies' handkerchiefs, if and when ascertained to be in a presentable condition. Who drank more quickly? Bloom, having the advantage of ten seconds at the initiation and taking from the concave surface of a spoon along the handle of which a steady flow of heat was conducted, 
three sips to his opponent's one, six to two, nine to three. What celebration accompanied his frequentative act? Concluding by inspection, but erroneously, that his silent companion was engaged in mental composition, he reflected on the pleasures derived from literature of instruction, rather than of amusement, as he himself had applied to the works of William Shakespeare more than once for the solution of difficult problems in imaginary or real life. Had he found their solution? In spite of careful and repeated reading of certain classical passages, aided by a glossary, he had derived imperfect convictions from the text, the answers not bearing in all points. What lines concluded his first piece of original verse written by him, potential poet, at the age of eleven in 1877, on the occasion of the offering of three prizes of ten shillings, five shillings, and two shillings sixpence respectively for competition by the Shamrock, a weekly newspaper. An ambition to squint at my verses in print makes me hope that for these you'll find room. If you so condescend, then please place at the end the name of yours truly, L. Bloom. Did he find four separating forces between his temporary guest and him? Name, age, race, creed. What anagrams had he made on his name in youth? Leopold Bloom. Elpod Bommel. Moldoplop, Bolopidum, Old Olibo, M.P. What acrostic upon the abbreviation of his first name had he, kinetic poet, sent to Miss Marion Molly Tweedy on the 14th February, 1888? Poets oft have sung in rhyme. Of music sweet, their praise divine. Let them hymn it nine times nine. Dearer far than song or wine, you are mine. The world is mine. What had prevented him from completing a topical song, music by R. G. Johnson, on the events of the past or fixtures for the actual years, entitled if Brian Boru could but come back and see Old Dublin now. Commissioned by Michael Gunn, Lycee of the Gaiety Theatre, 46, 47, 48, 49 South King Street, and to be introduced into the sixth scene, The Valley of Diamonds, of the second edition, 30 January 1893, of the grand annual Christmas pantomime, Sinbad the Sailor, Produced by R. Shelton, 26 December, 1892. Written by Greenleaf Whittier. Scenery by George A. Jackson and Cecil Hicks. Costumes by Mrs. and Miss Whelan under the personal supervision of Mrs. Michael Gunn. Ballots by Nessie Noir. Harlequinade by Thomas Otto. And sung by Nellie Bovervist, Principal Girl. Firstly, oscillation between events of imperial and local interest. The anticipated Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria, born 1820, assented 1837, and the posticipated opening of the new municipal fish market. Secondly, apprehension of opposition from extreme circles on the question of the respective visits of their royal highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of York, real, and of His Majesty King Brian Boru, imaginary. Thirdly, a conflict between professional etiquette and professional emulation concerning the recent erections of the Grand Lyric Hall on Burg Quay and the Royal Theatre in Hawkins Street. 
Fourthly, distraction resultant from compassion for Nelly Bovervist's non-intellectual, non-political, non-topical expression of countenance and concupiscence caused by Nelly Bovervist's revelations of white articles of non-intellectual, non-political, non-topical underclothing, while she, Nelly Bovervist, was in the articles. Fifthly, the difficulties of the selection of appropriate music and humorous allusions from Everybody's Book of Jokes, 1,000 pages and a laugh on every one. Sixthly, the rhymes, homophonous and cacophonous, associated with the names of the new Lord Mayor, Daniel Tallon, the new High Sheriff, Thomas Pyle, and the new Solicitor General, Dunbar Pluckett Barton. What relation existed between their ages? Sixteen years before, in 1888, when Bloom was of Stephen's present age, Stephen was six. Sixteen years after, in 1820, when Stephen would be of Bloom's present age, Bloom would be 54. In 1936, when Bloom would be 70, Stephen 54. Their ages, initially in the ratio of 16 to 0, would be as 17 and a half to 13 and a half. The proportion increasingly and the disparity diminishing according as arbitrary future years were added. For if the proportion existed in 1883 and continued immutable, conceiving that to be possible, till then 1904, when Stephen was 22, Bloom would be 374, and in 1920, when Stephen would be 38, as Bloom then was, Bloom would be 646, while in 1952, when Stephen would have attained the maximum post-alluvial age of 70, Bloom being 1190 years alive, having been born in the year 714, would have surpassed by 221 years the maximum antediluvial age, that of Methuselah, 969 years, while if Stephen would continue to live until he would attain that age in the year 3072 A.D., Bloom would have been obliged to have been alive 83,300 years, having been obliged to have been born in the year 81,396 B.C. What events might nullify these calculations? The secession of existence of both or either, the inauguration of a new era or calendar, the annihilation of the world and consequent extermination of the human species, inevitable but unpredictable. How many previous encounters prove their pre-existing acquaintance? Two, the first in the lilac garden of Matthew Dillon's house, Medina Villa, Kimmage Road, Roundtown, in 1887, in the company of Stephen's mother, Stephen being then of the age five and reluctant to give his hand in salutation, the second in the coffee room of Breslin's Hotel on a rainy Sunday in the January of 1892, in the company of Stephen's father and Stephen's granduncle, Stephen being then five years older. Did Bloom accept the invitation to dinner given then by the son and afterwards seconded by the father? Very gratefully, with grateful appreciation, with sincere appreciative gratitude, in appreciatively grateful sincerity of regret, he declined. Did their conversation on the subject of these reminiscences reveal a third connecting link between them? Mrs. Reardon, Dante, a widow of independent means, had resided in the house of Stephen's parents from 1st September 1888 to 29 December 1891, and had also resided during the years 1892, 1893, and 1894 in the City Arms Hotel, owned by Elizabeth O'Dowd of 54 Prussian Street, where, during parts of the year 1893 and 1894, she had been a constant informant of Bloom, who resided also in the same hotel, 
being at that time a clerk in the employment of Joseph Cuffey of Five Smithfield for the superintendence of sales in the adjacent Dublin cattle market on the North Circular Road. Had he performed any special corporal work of mercy for her? He had sometimes repelled her on warm summer evenings, an infirm widow of independent if limited means, in her convalescent bath chair with slow revolutions of its wheels as far as the corner of the North Circular Road, opposite Mr. Gavin Lowe's place of business, where she had remained for a certain time scanning through his one-lensed binocular field glasses unrecognizable citizens on tramcars, roadster bicycles equipped with inflatable pneumatic tires, hackney carriages, tandems, private and hired landaus, dog carts, pony traps, and brakes passing from the city to the Phoenix Park, and vice versa. Why could he then support that his vigil with the greater equanimity? Because in middle youth he had often sat observing through a roundel of bossed glass of a multicolored pane the spectacle offered with continual changes of the thoroughfare without. Pedestrians, quadrupeds, velocipedes, vehicles, passing slowly, quickly, evenly, round and round and round the rim of a round and round precipitous globe. What distinct different memories had each of her, now eight years deceased? The older, her bezique cards and counters, her sky terrier, her suppositious wealth, her lapses of responsiveness and incipient guitar deafness. The younger, her lamp of colza oil before the statue of the Immaculate Conception, her green and maroon brushes for Charles Stuart Parnell and for David Davitt, her tissue papers. Were there no means still remaining to him to achieve the rejuvenation which these reminiscences divulged to a younger companion rendered the more desirable? The indoor exercises, formerly intermittently practiced, subsequently abandoned, prescribed in Edward Sanchow's physical strength and how to obtain it, which, designed particularly for commercial men engaged in sedimentary occupations, were to be made with mental concentration in front of a mirror so as to bring into play the various families of muscles and produce successfully a pleasant rigidity, a more pleasant relaxation, and the most pleasant repristination of juvenile agility. Had any special agility been his in earlier youth? Though ring-weight lifting had been beyond his strength, and the full-circle gyration beyond his courage, yet, as a high school scholar, he had excelled in his stable and protracted execution of the half-lever movement on the parallel bars, in consequence of his abnormally developed abdominal muscles. Did either openly allude to their racial difference? Neither. What reduced to their simplest reciprocal form were Bloom's thoughts about Stephen's thoughts about Bloom, and about Stephen's thoughts about Bloom's thoughts about Stephen. He thought that he thought that he was a Jew, whereas he knew that he knew that he knew that he was not. What, the enclosure of reticence removed, were their respective parentages? Bloom, only born male, transubstantial heir of Rudolf Verag, subsequently Rudolf Bloom, of Zambadli, Vienna, Budapest, Milan, London, and Dublin, of Ellen Higgins, second daughter of Julius Higgins, born Caroli, and Fanny Higgins, born Hegarty, Stephen, eldest surviving male, consubstantial heir of Simon Dedalus of Cork, and Dublin, and of Mary, daughter of Richard and Christina Goulding, born Greer. Had Bloom and Stephen been baptized, and where, and by whom, cleric or layman? Bloom, three times, by the Reverend Mr. Gilmer Johnson, M.A., alone in the Protestant Church of St. Nicholas without, Coombe, by James O'Connor, Philip Gilligan, and James Fitzpatrick, together, 
under a pump in the village of Swords, and by the Rev. Charles Malone, C.C., in the church of the three patrons, Rathgar. Stephen, once, by the Rev. Charles Malone, C.C., alone, in the church of the three patrons, Rathgar. Did they find their educational careers similar? Substituting Stephen for Bloom Stoom would have passed successively through a dam school and the high school. Substituting Bloom for Stephen Bleefen would have passed successively through the preparatory junior middle and senior grades of the intermediate and through the matriculation, fine arts and second arts and arts degree courses of the Royal University. Why did Bloom refrain from stating that he had frequented the University of Life? Because of his fluctuating incertainty as to whether this observation had or had not already been made by him to Stephen or by Stephen to him. End of chapter 17, section A.